little mechanical nugget for today. There you go. You're, that's free of charge. Um, well, welcome to week three of our uh, uh, Disciples Discipling Sermon Series. We are working through uh, this series, helping, uh, hopefully helping us learn to not only be discipled, but to disciple other people. And as we begin to do that, that's the process that has to happen over and over again. And in this series, we are actually continuing to follow the Apostle Paul on his uh, discipling journey. We previously watched as he was being discipled by Barnabas, and now we have been watching as Paul has continued to disciple other godly men to help them become mature disciples of Jesus Christ as well. And that's what we all want to continue to do, not only be a disciple, but then to help others become disciples of Christ too. The discipleship relationship that we're going to explore today is possibly one of the most personal ones in all of Scripture that has been recorded for us. It it, it concerns a very personal uh, um, relational interaction that's going on between three guys. We'll get there in just a minute. But it is the most personal thing, one of the most personal things that have been recorded in Scripture. And so uh, we're going to dive into that today a little bit. It's the discipleship relationship between the Apostle Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus. And at the time that this event is recorded in Scripture for us, and that the, the event that we're going to be discussing today, all three of these men are believers in Jesus Christ, and they are disciples of Jesus Christ as well. And they're all trying their very best to live out their faith through their actions, even in the midst of some challenging relationship issues. I want you to think back through your life for just a moment. And I want to ask you this. Have you ever had to live out your faith and do the right thing in the midst of challenging relationship issues? Think back about that for just a minute. You ever had to live out your faith and, and apply that even in the midst of a relationship where there was challenges going on? Um, have you ever had to do that when the other people in the relationship were fellow Christians. Do you know that that happens at times? That that we have relationship issues between Christian people. And if we could just be honest uh, today, let's say it's hard dealing with uh, challenges within relationships, no matter if they are Christian or not Christian, but I would say especially if they're Christian brothers and sisters, sometimes that makes a challenge all the more harder to sort things out because we know we just can't walk away and go, never mind, forget you. Uh, we have to deal with it, and the Lord asks us to do those things. So we need to just acknowledge that there are challenges in relationships even between Christian brothers and sisters. Yet it's our responsibility uh, uh, that in these personal relationships that our faith be applied to the fullest. When we run into discipleship relationships where there are challenging circumstances, or even if you're not in disciple, uh, discipleship relationship, maybe you're just in a relationship and there is, there is challenges there, that's where our faith needs to be applied to the fullest, is with these people that we are in relationship with. It's those who are closest to us. The one are, th- those who are closest to us are the ones who should see our faith in action the most and they should see it the most genuinely lived out from us but guess what that is super hard to do is it not but that's where we need to begin to say i want to apply my faith even in the midst of these uh challenging um relationship challenges that we face so let's explore this relationship challenge together and the applied faith that we see lived out by these disciples of Jesus Christ because they are working to get this done. Let me give you a little context for each of these men who are in this relationship so we can understand what has transpired between them. The first person in the, in the relationship you will know is the Apostle Paul. And most of us are fairly familiar with him because we've been following his discipleship journey uh, for the last several months And we saw him become a believer in Jesus Christ and then grow to mature and become a mature disciple of Jesus Christ with the help of Barnabas, and as John just mentioned, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We see the Apostle Paul grow to be a mature disciple of Christ. 
Um, we've also followed along with Paul on several of his discipleship journeys, and we have witnessed the way that he has helped others to develop in their maturity. We, we just have gone through Timothy and Titus in the last two weeks, and we saw Paul uh, coach them and help them become mature disciples of Jesus Christ. And at the time that this event takes place today, Paul is now an old man. By his own admission, he says, I'm an old man. So we have seen him come towards the end of his life. And he says, I'm an old man. And he's actually in prison, uh, in presumably in Rome, when this uh, letter that we're going to discuss today was written. And he's in prison for having preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. But guess what? Even in that situation, he's trying to live out his faith to the fullest, and he's trying to make sure the relationships that he has with others are honoring to God, even though he's in the middle of prison, and, and he's writing this letter from prison. The second person that we have in this relationship is Onesimus, who is a runaway slave from the city of Colossae. Uh, Onesimus wasn't just a runaway, though. He's also a thief. He, he stole from his master Philemon when he left and departed, uh, uh, um, when, when he fled to become a runaway. He actually stole stuff from Philemon when he left. Onesimus somehow, we don't know exactly how, he makes it to Rome and he meets the Apostle Paul. And it's unclear to us whether it was in prison or just through the ministry that Paul had going on in, uh, in Rome. But somehow he meets Paul and he becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. And, be, and he becomes a new disciple that, that Paul is beginning to teach how to live out his faith. And so we have this runaway slave who is also a thief who has now become a believer in Jesus Christ. But guess what? He has some stuff in his past that he has to deal with. And, and, and Paul is there to, to kind of help him to do that. But that means there's another person in this relationship that has to be brought in. And that third person in the relationship, of, of course, is Philemon. He's the slave owner of Onesimus, and he's the one who had been doubly wronged by Onesimus running away and by the act of theft that, that Onesimus did when he left. But there's another catch in this relationship, because Philemon is also a believer in Jesus Christ, and he also somehow came to faith through the Apostle Paul's ministry. So the Apostle Paul has these two guys who he has relationship with, who he's discipling, that he's saying they have ought with one another. They got an issue between themselves, and the, the issue is Onesimus running away and uh, having stolen from Philemon. But there's something even more complicating in the situation, because Philemon is also a leader in the church. And there's even a church meeting in his home. So his actions and attitudes are seen by a lot of different people. And so Paul's saying, man, we have to address this issue. We have conflict between us, and we need to sort these things out. So there you have it. Some challenging issues in the midst of this relationship between three disciples of Jesus Christ. Three guys trying to live out their faith, and yet there is a conflict between at least two of them, right? So, so let me ask you this question. Since these are all disciples of Jesus Christ, which one of them needs to live out their faith through their actions? Think about that for just a minute. Which one of them needs to live out their faith and demonstrate that through their actions? You might remember last week that we learned from Paul in the letter to Titus that right belief rightly leads to right actions. So if all these guys believe the right things, then their actions should do, they should do the right things, right? So here's the correct answer, which you probably have already guessed. They are all equally required to live out their faith and represent Jesus Christ in this relationship. You know what we normally want to happen? You go first. You go first because you wronged me. No, 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 that's not how it works. Uh, we're we're going to learn today that, that, that they're all required to live out their faith in Jesus Christ and demonstrate Christ through their own lives and through their own interactions with other people. So they're all equally required to live out their faith. Yes, they may be at different levels of maturity in their faith. I'm sure that they are. Paul is a seasoned old veteran Christian, right? He says in this letter, I am old. I'm old, old. But I'm still trying to live out my faith. 
Onesimus is probably a little bit younger, but he's been, or sorry, well, we'll go with Onesimus. Onesimus is probably a lot younger, and he's new to the faith, but he still needs to live out the faith that he has. Philemon, too, is probably a mature follower of Jesus Christ, but he, too, even though he's at a different level, has to live out his faith. And they're all still learning to apply their faith to every aspect of their lives. But they are all required to live out what they know and to show it in their actions. No matter their age or stage, they're to demonstrate what they know about Jesus Christ through their attitudes and actions towards others. You see, we aren't responsible for the other person's actions or attitudes, but we are certainly responsible for whose? Our own. We know that, don't we? Do we live that out? Or do we say, hey, you do it first. I want to see you go first, then I'll go, right? They ever did that with your brother or sister? Mom said, hey, you guys apologize to one another, and you're like, you go first. No, no, you go first. No, you go first. Or I will do it at the same time, right? We kind of need to do it at the same time because we're all disciples of Jesus Christ. And, And if we have an ought, then we need to work on that. And we are certainly responsible for our own actions and attitudes, and we'll be judged on how we respond. Guess what? We're not judged on how the other person responds but we are certainly judged about how we respond and how we represent Christ in a relationship with conflict or concern. So that's a very uh, big thing that we need to understand. Let's see how these disciples of Christ take steps to begin to work through their challenges in their relationship. And it may surprise you to know that we have a copy of the letter that the Apostle Paul sends to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. And it's actually the New Testament book of Philemon. This is the very personal letter that Paul writes on behalf of Onesimus to Philemon because they got a problem in their relationship. And they're having challenges and issues, and they need to work through it as brothers in Christ. And so you can find the book of Philemon right after the book of Titus that we studied last week. And you can find it right before the book of Hebrews, um, which the men are studying in their their, uh, Bible study. So it's, it's right after the book of Titus and right before the book of Hebrews. Would you turn there with me, or you can look at your handout, or look on the screen, and let me read you the entirety of this letter that Paul sends on behalf of Onesimus. And and, and listen as we hear these three men try to live out their faith in the midst of relational challenges, because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to live out their faith in the midst of relational challenges. Here's the letter that Paul uh, gives, uh, that writes... This letter is from Paul, a prisoner for preaching the good news about Jesus Christ, and from our brother Timothy. Remember when we studied Timothy and we said he was actually a co-author of many of the letters that Paul sends? Well, here's one of them where where, uh, Timothy is cited as a a co-author. I am writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister Alphia, and to our fellow fellow soldier Archippus, And to the church that meets in your house, may God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience the good things we have in Christ. Your love, has given me, uh, your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. That's why I boldly ask a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it's the right thing for you to do. But because of our love, I prefer simply to ask you, consider this a request from me, Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you to show kindness to my child, Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus Onesimus hasn't, uh, hasn't been much use to you in the past, but now he is very useful to both of us. I am sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. I want you to, I, I want, to, uh, sorry, I want to keep him here with me while I am in these chains for preaching the good news. And he would have helped me on your behalf. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I want you to help because you were willing, not because you were forced. 
it seems you lost Onesimus uh, for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave. He is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now you, now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Uh, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, and I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. Yes, my brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. I am confident as I write this letter to you, um, I'm confident as I write this letter to you, sorry, that you will do what I ask and even more. The, uh, one more thing, please prepare a guest room for me, for I, for I am hoping that God will answer your prayers and that, let me return to you soon. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings, as do Mark, uh, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. There we have a very personal letter from the Apostle Paul. Uh, and it's uh, between three disciples, three fellow disciples of Jesus Christ, who are trying to live out their faith in the midst of relational challenges between the three of them. Now, there's a lot of great advice in this letter that can help us live out our faith in real time with real people, because that's what we're called to do, right? We have to live out our faith in real time with real other human beings who are trying to do the exact same thing. But let me just highlight a few of these uh, pieces of information that we can make use of today. Now, you'll notice that none of these are going to sound new to you at all. They're actually ones that we have covered in previous sermons. But you know what we're seeing in this uh, exchange with this letter? We're seeing the applied lessons of discipleship being lived out by these three men. They are living out the discipleship principles that Paul has been teaching others that were taught to him, that he's encouraging other people to live out. They've not just been teaching it, they're trying to live it out amongst them together. And so that's what we're going to be seeing today is these applied um, discipleship principles being lived out in real time with three real disciples of Jesus Christ. The first applied lesson of discipleship is this, step up for new believers. Do you, do you remember back when we talked about uh, making this, the, uh, talked about the sermon series, making the making of a disciple? We watched the Apostle Paul have somebody step up for him when he was a young believer and they didn't believe that he had been saved. Do you remember who it was? Who stepped up for him? Barnabas. Barnabas, when Paul was young and when Paul was a young believer, had somebody step up for him. And it was Barnabas, and we, we studied that. And now we see Paul, now that he is older, stepping up once again for another young believer who is Onesimus. And, and many years have passed since Paul had Barnabas stepped up for him. And the Apostle Paul is now an old man. And he has the, he has the opportunity to step up for Onesimus, who is also a young believer. And it's possible that if Onesimus went back and said, hey, Philemon, my owner, I'm a believer now. You, you, you can trust me. I'm a brother in Christ. How many of you think that he would have believed him? Probably would have had the same reception that Paul had when he showed up in Jerusalem, right? I don't know. I'm not going to believe you. But with a letter from Paul saying, look, this guy really is a believer and he is now a brother in Christ. He has really changed and he's returning to you to set things right, Onesimus has a better shot at sorting this problem out that he has, that he has created. It's possible even that if Onesimus returned to Philemon without Paul's letter uh, and his in intervention, he would have been severely punished at the least and possibly even killed on sight if he returned as a runaway slave. He, Philemon had every right to just kill him on the spot. And so this is a big deal when he says, I want to go back and make this right, but I need someone to step up for me. And Paul says, I'll step up. I'm going to write you a letter. I'm going to tell uh, 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 Philemon that, that you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that your life has changed. 
the Apostle Paul steps up and he writes this letter to Philemon. And he vouches for Onesimus that he has truly become a brother in the faith and is returning to set things right with Philemon. Then the Apostle Paul goes one step further than just writing a letter. And he says this in verse 18. If, he says this to Philemon, to Philemon. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Paul says, look, I'm not just going to write a letter. I'm going to take his debt on myself. Whatever he stole from you, whatever the value of that is, charge it to me, and I'm going to pay it. That, that, that lets us know that, that Paul is serious about standing in the gap for this new young believer who's trying to do what? This new young believer is trying to live out his faith, and he realizes he has some some sinful acts and mistakes in his past that he needs to make right. And Paul is walking alongside of him, trying to help that to happen. And Paul says, look, I'm, I'm going to pay for whatever he stole. Charge it to me. I will pay that debt. Paul is stepping up for Onesimus in every way possible because he is living out the example of what Jesus Christ had done for him. Jesus Christ stepped up and paid for Paul's debt. And Paul had a lot of debt, didn't he? He even, he, he even went around killing and persecuting believers in Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus said, I forgive you. I take that debt on myself. You are forgiven. So my friends, shouldn't we too step up for others because Jesus stepped up for us and he paid the price for our sinful acts too? We should. And we're being called to and Paul is calling uh, uh, calling for Philemon to do the same, but he is setting that example. Paul is setting that example with, with his own life. He's stepping up. He says, someone paid my debt. I, I'm going to stand in the gap for him. I'm going to vouch that he is a believer in Jesus Christ, and then I'm going to pay the debt that he owes because somebody did that for me. The second applied lesson that we see lived out here is this. Put your faith into action. We have heard this over and over and over again. But this is what is required of all of us. Whether we're old or whether we're young or whether we're in between, we must put our faith into action. We've already seen the Apostle Paul put his faith into action by stepping up for Onesimus and being willing uh, uh, to write the letter and to pay the debt. Now we see him calling on Philemon to put his faith in action too. And once again, when Paul calls on Philemon to do this, note well that he bases his call for Philemon to respond. It's based on what Christ had already done for them. Paul ties the expected response from Philemon to what they had already personally experienced themselves from Christ. Remember, we're always pointing back to Christ. We're always demonstrating Christ in our relationship. Yeah, Barnabas might have done for this for him, but guess what? He doesn't point to Barnabas. He points back to Christ because Barnabas was just doing what Christ would have done. Paul's doing now in this relationship what Christ would have done, and he's calling Philemon. Would you do what Christ would do in this relationship for Onesimus? So look again at the words that Paul uses uh, for Philemon, or to Philemon in verse 6. Paul says this, I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your wallet. Is that what it says? No. It has nothing to do with his wallet. It has everything to do with his faith. I'm calling on you to put your faith into action. He says, I'm praying that you will put, your, put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and as you experience all the good things that we have in Christ. Paul's saying, we, brother, have experienced this ourselves. We've experienced forgiveness. We've experienced someone standing in the gap for us. We've experienced this on a grander level, and it came through Christ. And we didn't deserve it either, but he did it for us. So, brother, I'm asking you, extend this grace to Onesimus. Paul continues saying this in verse 8. That's why I'm boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it's the right thing for you to do. Paul is speaking to a brother in Christ who he knows has lived out what Christ has offered to him. 
And he's enjoyed those benefits of those things. And Paul says, I'm asking a favor of Philemon. Uh, of Philemon. And he asked a favor to show kindness to Onesimus in verse 10. And he says, do it because it's the right thing for you to do in verse 8. And what, remember when we talked about what's the right thing to do in relationships? It's what Christ would do in that relationship. That's the right thing to do. What would Christ do in this relationship? And, and, and he, Paul is calling uh, Philemon, do what Christ would do. Put your faith into action. This was already done for you. Extend this grace to another brother. Once again, we see an appeal, a, an, an appeal to the expectation that right belief le- rightly leads to right action. Brother, you believe this. Brother, you have experienced this. Now demonstrate that through your actions to others. So let me ask you the question this morning. Are you responding to others based on the, all the good things that you understand and have experienced in Christ? Or are you responding to others out of your own selfishness or out of your own hurt feelings? Guess what? Selfishness is real. Guess what? Hurt feelings are real. And guess what we want to respond out of first? Selfishness and hurt feelings. We're human. But as disciples of Jesus Christ, our first response is to say, I need to respond the way that Christ responded to me. Because he forgave me. And he gave me the grace and mercy that I needed. And I didn't deserve it. And I did do the wrong thing. And yet he still forgave me. And he still restored me. Paul is encouraging all of us to respond out of our faith in Christ. And out of the good things that we've already experienced from him. All of us who call ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ. Or believers in Jesus. We've experienced forgiveness. We have experienced him paying our debts. We have experienced his mercy time after time after time. And then sometimes it's time for us to show those same things to other people, not because they deserve it, but because of what Christ has already done for us. Don't miss the fact that Onesimus too is putting his faith into action as he voluntarily returns to Philemon. He is stepping out in faith. He is saying, I am going to walk my faith out all the way from Rome back to Colossae, where I left my master and where I stole his stuff. And I'm going to return and I'm going to make it right because that's the right thing for me to do. Onesimus knows that he was wrong to do what he did. And his new faith in Christ tells him, that he needs to return and seek forgiveness for, from Philemon. What an amazing change in this young man, right? He left. He, he's transformed uh, and saved in Rome. Guess what he could have done? Whoo! Thank the Lord I am forgiven. I'm going to keep on heading west, right? Because my past is in the past. And those sins that I did, that was before I got saved. They're forgiven. But he wants to live out what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he says, I left a man that I wronged and I stole stuff from him. And I feel like I need to make that right. So I can't go west. I got to go back east. And I got to sort this out because I wronged a brother in Christ. So he willingly returns, is sent back with a letter. How many of us would have said, forgive and forget, brother. See ya. Onesimus takes his faith seriously. And he wants to be a mature disciple of Christ. And he says, look, I can't go forward unless I go back and make this right. So he lives out his faith in a very real way that, it, that is easy to, to look past. And he begins to head back to Onesimus, or sorry, Onesimus heads back to Philemon. Think about it for a moment. Which person is, has the most on the line in this situation? Who, who is living out their faith the largest? It's Onesimus, isn't it? It's his life that's on the line. If Philemon doesn't believe Paul or him, could be curtains for him or at least severe punishment. 
But Onesimus says, I'm going to trust in God. And I'm going to walk my faith out. And I'm going to do the right thing. And I'm going to leave myself in God's hands and let him sort out the rest. But as for me, i got to do the right thing. And i got to go back and try and make this right. Onesimus' life is literally on the line. And yet he chooses to put his faith into action and trust the Lord for the outcome. My friends, that is really living out your faith with all that you are, with all, all in, saying, I'm going to go back and make this right. And he does. This leads us to the third applied lesson of discipleship that we see these guys trying to live out together. And it's this. Treat others as fellow disciples. Treat others as fellow disciples. How we treat others when there, are re- or when there are challenges in our relationship is what sets us apart as Jesus' disciples. Listen to that again. How we treat others in the midst of having relational challenges is what sets us apart from the rest of the world. And it defines whose we are. Note that I said when there are challenges in our relationships. Because we all know that challenges are bound to happen even between fellow disciples of Jesus Christ. Do you know that? It's not when, it's not if, it's when. It's not this might happen, it's this will happen. It's this is probably happening to some of us now who are listening to this sermon, right? This is where real life happens. But it's how we live out our faith in the midst of those challenging circumstances that define us and set us apart from the rest of the world. Do you know the world has no lack of conflict? Do you live there? The world has no lack of conflict, but they deal with it much differently than the disciples of Jesus Christ. It's how we treat others uh, when we go through these challenging things that proves whose we are. Remember the words that Jesus gave to his very first disciples in John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. And he says this, So now I am giving you a new command. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for, on, well, your love for one another will prove to the world That you are my disciples. The way we love one another proves that we are his disciples, even in the midst of conflict. And don't miss the fact that Jesus is saying, I did this first for you. Love as I loved you. I've set the example already. Now you go and do that to each other as well. Often when there are challenges in our relationship, we immediately default to treating the other person like an enemy. You don't need to say amen. I already know. I live there too, right? We go from friend to enemy right away. It happens instantly, right? Because we think they have wronged me. And after all, uh, I had, they had no right to do that. And now, guess what? They are my mortal enemy, right? They're no longer a brother. They're no longer a friend. They go right to enemy. And you can only think bad things about them when their name comes up. I don't need any amens. I already know, right? But that's not what we're called to do as disciples of Jesus Christ. We're not to treat other people as enemies any longer. We're to treat them as fellow disciples, fellow people who have grace and need our grace as well. Paul models what Jesus commanded us to do. Paul isn't ignoring that Philemon had been wronged, because he had. Paul isn't ignoring that, but he's calling Philemon to work through the wrong and the challenges as brothers or fellow disciples of Jesus Christ, and there's a difference. Paul lets him know when he writes the letter, look, we are not enemies. We are brothers in Christ, sorting this wrong out. There is a wrong. It needs to be righted, and we're going to work towards that, but we're going to work towards that not as enemies, but as brothers of Christ, as fellow disciples. Note here how Paul refers to Philemon throughout the letter. We see him refer to him in verses uh, 1, 7, and 20. And, And Paul opens the letter saying this, 
in verse 1. I am writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker. He's saying, brother, I love you. And we're on the same team. We're co-workers for the gospel. We're, we're trying to live out our faith together. We're not enemies. So very early in the letter, Paul says, we're brothers. We're, we're, we're co-workers. You're, you're beloved by me. Verse 7, he says this, Your love has given me uh, much joy and comfort, my brother. For your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God peop God's people. Again, he says, you're my brother. You're not my enemy. We're sorting this out as brothers in Christ. And then in verse 20, again, he repeats it. Yes, my brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. Brother in Christ. We need to work this out, and we can do this uh, uh, in grace and peace together. Paul acknowledges from the beginning to the end of the letter that Philemon is a brother in Christ and is loved by him. Paul is setting the tone for the conversation to happen. He is using intentional word to say, look, you're not my enemy. We have an enemy, but it's not each other. It's the evil one who wants to divide, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy all relationships that honor God. And he wants to get in there and drive a wedge. And Paul says, no, not, not here. You're not my enemy. You're my brother. And you're my co-worker in the gospel. Note how Paul then goes on to refer to Onesimus as well in verses 10 and 16. And he says this, I appeal to you to show kindness to my child Onesimus. Paul had become his spiritual father by leading him to Christ. And he says, look, he, he isn't just your slave anymore. He, he's my child. He's a spiritual child of God. Treat him as such. He, he's not a seasoned veteran, so guess what? He's probably going to stumble uh, over uh, trying to make things right with you. He's probably not going to have all the right words or do the right things, but, but give him grace. Because you were there too once. And he's a young believer trying to live out his faith. And he needs us older believers to encourage him and to extend grace and mercy to him. So please receive him. Show him kindness as my child. Verse 16, Paul goes on to say this. He is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave. He is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now, uh, now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Paul again is using that language of saying, look, we're on the same team. We don't need to fight. Yes, we got a conflict. He he's never denies that there's a conflict. He says, let's deal with this as brothers. Let let's treat each other as brothers as we work through this. Through his words, Paul is setting the tone for a God-honoring resolution of this conflict to be settled between the brothers in the Lord who are in, or who are acting in love towards one another. Paul is using his words to set the tone and to define who these other people are in a relationship. And he says, you're my brothers. You're my brothers. Let's sort this out in a God-honoring way. So let me ask you, how do you treat others in the midst of challenges? And do you use your words to set the proper tone expecting to negotiate a God-honoring resolution or you just want to be right or you just want your point to be made or do you say brothers, sisters, how do we work this out in a God-honoring way? Let's do this together. Let's treat others as fellow disciples as we sort this out. Proverbs 15.1 says that, says that which is on the screen. A gentle answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. What's the first thing that wants to come out of our mouth? It's usually not a gentle answer, is it? I just only speak for myself. But Jesus says, wait, wait, wait. Before you talk, think about all that I have done for you. And give a gentle response. Not, not a harsh word. So use your words to set the tone, to, to get to a God-honoring resolution in this situation. So my fellow disciples, if we are disciples of Jesus Christ, then we must act like it, even in the midst of challenging relationship issues, which we will all have at some point or another, if not currently now. 
And we need to learn to respond as disciples. This is where our discipleship is displayed to others around us and even to those who are closest to us who should see it the most genuine. Yeah, it's going to be clunky at times. I'm pretty sure that this relationship between Paul and Onesimus and Philemon was a little clunky, but they were trying to work it out as brothers in Christ. What an amazing thing. We don't have the recorded response from Philemon uh, to this letter that Paul wrote and sent with Onesimus. We don't have the response, but guess what? That's okay, because we don't answer for Philemon's response, do we? Whose response do we answer for? Our own. We have to answer for how we respond to our relationship challenges. It doesn't matter how Philemon responded. It does matter how we respond. And so that's what I want to ask you today. How are you responding in the midst of your relationship challenges? Are you responding as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you living your faith out even when it hurts or even when it's real clunky with other people, but you say, Let, let's just try to do it. Let's just try to do it in a God-honoring way. Let's do this. Often, it's working through these challenges together that all of us grow in applying our faith and bringing glory to God. You see, we only grow so much singing hallelujah on Sunday morning. We grow a lot more when there's conflict and we say, brothers, we're going to have to sort this out. And we're going to have to do this in a way that honors God. And it's going to make me grow. And I can't speak for you, but it makes all of us grow. We have to really put our faith into action, even in the midst of relationships with other people that are challenging to us. So let me ask you today, is there a relationship with challenges that you need to work through in a loving and Christ-honoring way? Is there one? This is a great week to work on that. And you can be thankful that this is an opportunity that you have and that you've had this training this week and not next week, right? So, so let me encourage you today, be the one. Be the one who's willing to step up and say, look, there's a conflict here. and I, I'd like to sort through it with you in a God-honoring way. I, I, I'd like to deal with this situation. Maybe there's another new believer that you need to step up for that you can see they're trying to make things right, but it's not going well. But maybe you can stand beside them and say, can I help you in this situation? Can, can, I, can I just help you through getting through the situation and, and speak on their behalf? Maybe you even have to pay their debt because somebody did it for you. And you say, let me do this for you. Someone did it once for me. Put your faith into action. Step up with uh, those who need help. Put your faith into action and live out what God has already done for you. You know what that is. We are called to go and do that for other people as we run across them in our paths. And then let me encourage you to treat others, not as enemies, but as fellow disciples of Jesus Christ. Or if they don't know him yet, treat them as somebody who needs to know Jesus Christ and needs to see him demonstrated through you in that relationship that you're in with him. Is this hard to do? You betcha. Do we do it in our own strength? Not at all. We do it in the power of the Holy Spirit who leads us into these things, who give us the words to say, and who we can humble ourselves before and say, Lord, I'm going into this conversation. Would you help me to use my words to speak your truth? Would you help me to have the strength to live out my faith, even if it hurts? Even if it means i got to sort through some things I don't want to sort through. Even if it means I have to forgive some things that were done to me. Father, would you help me to live out my faith, that I would be a true disciple of yours? Let me encourage you to use this example of Paul in Philemon and Philemon and Onesimus. Use it as a guide to put your faith into Jesus Christ into action in the places where you have relational challenges as well. It can and will work out to the extent that we entrust those things to God. It doesn't mean that it's all going to be hugs and roses by the end of the day. But you can say, look, I did the God-honoring thing, and I tried to make it right with my brothers and sisters or whoever I'm not with. The Lord is calling us to do those things. He has already done them for us. And he's calling us to be the disciples who will go and do those things for others and bring him glory.
Would you just remain seated as I pray for you today? Because I want you to continue to listen to the Holy Spirit. Is there someone or some relationship that you need to set right this season? Would you have the courage to ask the Lord to help you to step up and have those conversations and to have the faith to be the person that you need to be in that situation to represent Christ well? Let me pray for us as we do this. Heavenly Father, thank you for dealing with the relational challenges that we had with you. And you did that by sending us your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, you helped to mend our relationship with the Father. And we were only able to do that through your grace and through your mercy. Father, remind us of all that you have done for us. All those good things. And Jesus, we're asking that you would help us this week. That we would demonstrate the love and the forgiveness and the mercy that we have received from you. In these relationships with these other people who we have challenges with. Would you give us the strength that we need? Would you give us the words that we need? Would you give us the courage that we need to live as brothers and sisters in Christ and to sort out these issues in a way that is God-honoring? Lord, we ask that you would use our words, give us the right words that would set the tone for these relationships. Lord, help us not to respond to others as enemies, but Lord, as co-laborers with you and as future disciples of Jesus Christ who want to see if this faith really works in this world when it's really put through the ringer. Father, would you help us to live out our faith? May we do the right thing and represent you well in these relationships. Give us the courage, give us the timing, give us the words, and may we bring glory and honor to you as we live out our faith in the midst of these relationships with others. Thank you for all that you've done, Lord. Thank you for all that you're going to do. Lead us, guide us, and direct us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand for the benediction? <clears throat> Go in the love that the Father has lavishly poured out on us over and over again. Go in the forgiveness that we receive through his son, Jesus Christ, and extend that same forgiveness to others. And go in the power of the Holy Spirit that he would give you the words and the strength to say and to do what you need to say and do this week to bring honor to him. You are dismissed.